I obviously didn't want to be sacked before I resigned. I find that uh, almost offensive. Absolute and utter bullshit. This generation has taken over. John Houston has lost. The situation was becoming intolerable. Politically, I disliked him and distrusted him. The Menzies Era on the Liberals commences 8.30 next Wednesday. Mild-mannered Wallace and faithful Gromit are looking for a weekend destination. Gromit, that's it, cheese. We'll go somewhere where there's cheese. And so they're cheddar cheese bound. But what they don't count on is a custodian with a very bad attitude. Wallace and Gromit in a grand day out. Eight o'clock Friday. in business for helping people, darling. I'm a journalist. John Hines Movie. And you're the one who decides what goes in the paper. In the cutthroat world of the gutter press. Were well, you angling for me to suck up? Oh, oh, just giving you the knockback. It's dog eat dog. You know what you're doing, and you don't bloody care. Anything for a page one scoop. Oh, to break about your payments for perverse sexual pleasures. I like to You absolute bastard. News Hounds, 8.30 Friday. Coming up on the 7.30 report, Melbourne's newest TV channel fires up tomorrow night and community broadcasters say they're here to stay. With all the work we've done, they'll have a hell of a time getting us off the air. That's coming up. Hello again, Ian Henderson in the Melbourne newsroom. Swiss police expect to find more bodies at the scene of a mass suicide in the country's southwest. So far, 39 people, members of a religious sect, have been found dead at the scene of two fires in the districts of Fribourg and Valais. Police have found an audio cassette and believe it may shed some light on the incident. Queensland health officials believe they now have firm evidence that trainer Vic Rail and 14 of his horses died of the same illness. It's thought to be an equine virus which attacks the lungs. And in cricket, Australia off to a great start in the second test against Pakistan. A ton to Michael Slater. A T, the Australians 2 for 187. The batsman out, Taylor for 69 and Boone for just 4. Melbourne tomorrow, fine with showers developing, a top of 18. Good night. Scientists have warned that the golden age of unprecedented good health is about to end. As frightening new viruses emerge, so too are new strains of old diseases like malaria and TB. Too tough for the known drugs. The March of the Superbugs, late line 10.30. It was during her childhood... He followed me in there. ...that the offence took place. I took off my dress because I was scared. But she can still remember. I was crying. And she wants to see justice done. I think you ought to think about this very carefully. I want him to know what it's like to feel dirty and ashamed. A powerful story about sexual abuse. He did those things to me. Janus, 8.30 Thursday, ABC. Our species has the heaviest parental burden of any animal on Earth. Why do parents lavish so much love and attention on raising their young? It's the arrival of the firstborn that marks the moment when they begin to question the, the human life cycle. Society's moulding of our children can be constructively inventive or potentially violent. These particular children have been trained as expert killers. There's a vacant blankness on their faces. The Human Animal, 9.30 Thursday, ABC. We wish to advise that the following documentary, Ratlines, the Nazi escape route in 1945, contains scenes which some viewers may find disturbing. Fifth of May, 1990, Stuttgart Airport. After nearly half a century of exile in Argentina, Josef Schwamberger returns to Germany. The 78-year-old has not come of his own free will. For decades, the famous Nazi hunter Simon Wiesenthal has pursued him and worked for his extradition. 
Er war der Kommandant des Ghettos in Przemysl, verantwortlich. He was commandant of the ghetto in Przemysl, responsible for many, many murders. Then he became overseer at slave camps in Poland, at Mielec and Stalowa Wola. When captured in 1945, he confessed to personal killings. His path was littered with corpses. The arrival was covered by the press and television, and many people felt sorry for Schwamberger. Naturally, an old man brought to trial. People felt pity for him. But he never showed pity for the people at his mercy, some of them older than he is now. We must think of the future. Perhaps at this very moment, the murderers of tomorrow are being born. We didn't know when the murderers of our families were being born. They must learn that just like Schwamberger, 48 years after the deed, 10,000 kilometers from the scene of the crime, the murderers of tomorrow must learn that there is no peace for them. and the pursuit of Nazi and other war criminals began before the collapse of the Thousand-Year Reich. As the Red Army closed in from the east and the American and British troops from the west, the organizers and perpetrators of millions of murders started worrying about their own skins. The BBC repeatedly broadcast the Moscow Declaration drawn up by the Allies. Those who have been responsible for, or who have taken a consenting part in atrocities, massacres and executions, the three Allied powers will pursue them to the uttermost ends of the earth and will deliver them to their accusers. A song popular at the end of the war promises that a miracle will happen. The defeated German army hoped in vain. The Americans enter Pilsen. The Russians have recaptured Vilna. The liberated countries are overjoyed to greet the Allies. The lists of war criminals have already been drawn up. The Nuremberg trials already prepared. After 12 years in the shadow of the swastika, millions of war dead and Europe in ruins. As if anything could be worse than the slaughter on the battlefields, there then came the horrors of the concentration camps. These pictures from American archives were taken a week after Germany's surrender. The citizens of Weimar are conducted round Buchenwald. Their faces show sadness and dismay, but also deep shock and disbelief. For years they had closed their eyes to what was taking place under their noses, but they were not the guilty ones. Those guilty of this evil had been issued with false documents by the Gestapo and the security service before the end of the war. And when the state issues such documents, they are, in effect, genuine. The entire Nazi security network, nearly a million strong, was declared a criminal organization by the Allies. 
In the American zone, the automatical arrest handbook was issued for the identification of Gestapo, SS, SD personnel, and other important functionaries of the fascist regime. In one single night in July 1945, 70,000 suspects were interned. But the sheer number of interrogations and proceedings made it easier for the SS Blood Brothers to disguise themselves as ordinary members of the armed forces and to make escape plans for seriously incriminated comrades. In secret papers discovered only years later with the code name Operation Brandy, an American undercover agent had reported on the establishment of escape organizations inside the American internment camps. In addition to Brüderschaft, Brotherhood, and Spinner, Spider, he identified the underground organization named Odessa. In German, the letters stand for Organization of Former SS Members. The head of this movement was Otto Skorzeny, a prominent SS leader during the Third Reich. Uber Sturmbahnführer Skorzeny made a name for himself in 1943 by rescuing Mussolini from his mountainous exile in Gran Sasso. He was Hitler's specialist in sabotage and undercover operations. There is film of his interrogation in an American prisoner of war camp. Here he shows his captors the gold watch Mussolini sent him out of gratitude. In spite of clear warnings from the US Secret Service, Skorzeny escaped under circumstances that have never been made clear. Living in Madrid, protected by General Franco, he helped to extend the international network of Nazi escape routes. The best known and the most effective was Odessa. There were other organizations, such as Spinner, but they were very localized. Odessa operated on a route from Bremen to Bari across the occupied zones. They had various ways of getting their people into Italy. This idyllic landscape in the Salzkammergut, the so-called Alpine Fortress, played a central part in the establishment of the various escape organizations. Early in 1945, while the Allies were pushing towards Berlin, some of the Nazi leaders, including head of the security services, Kaltenbrunner, and Otto Skorzeny with his SS tank troops, regrouped here in the Austrian Alps. But their plans to defend this redoubt were abandoned when Hitler committed suicide. Villagers have testified that at night, numerous boxes, presumably containing stolen valuables, weapons and compromising documents, were sunk into the deep waters of the Alpine lakes. The water, low in oxygen, has preserved the treasures, and most of them are still intact today. Boxes have been found. Divers have often been seen here in the lakes of the Salzkammergut. And they were underneath the cliff where we've just come from. And what's down there is a great mystery. Salvage operations in Lake Toplitz have, over the years, produced some of the excellently forged banknotes, which on Hitler's orders had been printed at Sachsenhausen concentration camp. The search for the Reichsbank's gold, rumored to be here, has cost many a diver his life. There is plenty of evidence that in this remote region, plans were laid for what might have become the largest escape organization in history. Some believe that the gold was recovered soon after the war and used for escape organizations like Odessa and Spinner. That may be partly true, but I'm convinced that a hoard of gold still lies here. Not in the lake, but buried. And that those responsible have died or cannot find the hiding place. On the other side of the Alps, in the Weinbergen above Muran, 
Friedrich Schwendt, the mastermind behind Germany's forged foreign currencies, lived in great style. From Schloss Labers, Labers Castle, counterfeit British banknotes were distributed throughout the world. Hitler hoped in vain that this would ruin the British economy. Schwendt, together with Walter Rauf, former organizer of the gas wagons, the mobile gas chambers, put the profits from his forgeries towards the financing of Odessa. As in Lake Toplitz, the owners of Schloss Labers searched for treasure, hoping to find, behind walled-up arches in the cellar, the legendary Nazi fortune. So this is the Wiesen Mauer. This is the main wall here. And, the and there are the old cellar walls. And here is this is tolle Loch. We found this amazing tunnel about a year ago. Friedrich Schwendt made this his base. The castle was already occupied by another SS unit, but they had to leave. It was all secret state business, and my grandparents weren't allowed into the place. That was in 44. In secret service jargon, the Nazi escape routes were called rat lines. The most important routes between Austria and Italy had safe houses at regular intervals, rat houses, where the escapers were looked after. A name that crops up in documents and statements is the Albergo Lupo in the Bremer Pass. The man who ran the guest house then is dead. His son doesn't want to discuss it. Everywhere we came up against walls of silence whenever we asked about the furtive travelers of those post-war days. To insiders, the rat lines were also known as the monastery route or the Vatican line. And when the fugitives were hidden in one of the many monasteries on the way, there was little chance of being discovered by local or military police. In Italy, the Nazis worked together with a Vatican mission that helped refugees out of Eastern Europe, which had become communist. So the Odessa people used the Vatican mission, which was led by Bishop Alois Hudal, who was certainly in the know, because he wrote in his memoirs that he was proud to help these people get away. When it came to expenses, some of the finance was provided by the Catholic organization Caritas. I doubt if they knew too much, because so many genuine refugees went to South America. On the journey through Rome, some of the most important fugitives went direct to the Vatican, to the Cloister dell'Anima, where they were safe from the Italian police and the Allied military authorities. This was revealed in a top-secret report made by American secret agent La Vista, which only became available in the 1980s. The agent La Vista, who was committed to tracking down the pro-fascist escape organizations, said in his report, The Vatican is the largest single organization involved in the illegal movement of emigrants. And moreover, the Vatican justifies its participation in this illegal trafficking by its wish to infiltrate people, regardless of their political status, into European and Latin American countries as long as they are anti-communist and pro-Catholic. The agent discovered that visas for the journey overseas were provided by the International Red Cross. Yes, all the papers issued in Italy came from the Red Cross. 
The Vatican had an arrangement with South American countries that Red Cross papers would be used. When a bishop asked for papers for a refugee from Croatia, a certain Eichmann, but Eichmann went under the name of Clement, then of course this poor Croatian refugee got his papers immediately. This photo, taken in 1952, shows Eichmann together with Fliegeroberst Rudel on the refugee ship to South America. But not only Eichmann travelled with Red Cross papers bearing the coveted signature of the Croatian priest Draganovic, a man loyal to Bishop Hudal. Other travellers along the rat lines were... The Auschwitz doctor Mengele wanted for 100,000 murders, destination Chile. Alois Brunner, Eichmann's specialist for deportation, guilty of murdering 120,000 Jews, destination Syria. Franz Stangl, commandant at Treblinka, accused of 700,000 murders, escaped from prison in Linz, destination Brazil. Walter Rauf, organizer of the gas wagons in which 180,000 Jews were murdered, destination Chile. Josef Schwamberger, who was returned to Germany 45 years later, traveled via Rome to Argentina. And Klaus Barbie, head of the Gestapo in Lyon, condemned to death by the French in his absence for torture and countless murders. He traveled to Bolivia with a Red Cross pass under the name Klaus Altmann, a mechanic, married, and naturally Catholic. When Barbie was extradited to France by the Bolivian government in 1983, it caused a political sensation. It became known that the infamous Butcher of Lyon had worked for six years with the CIC, the American Secret Service, as an anti-communist agent, often contacting the still active network of his former SS and Gestapo comrades. Erhard Dabringhaus, who had to emigrate to America after Hitler seized power, was his American liaison officer. I knew what he'd been, but my former colleagues always said, you don't really know what he's done. You know he was in France with the Gestapo, but you haven't found out what his duties were. How did you know who he was? One day, Kurt Merck came to me, Barbie wasn't there, and said that when the French find Klaus Barbie's mass graves in Lyon, then even General Eisenhower won't be able to protect him. General Eisenhower ihn nicht mehr beschützen. And he was telling the truth. He was there at the time. He told me he'd seen a hundred men in Montluc prison hanging by their thumbs until they died. I said, look, we're working with a genuine war criminal. So I passed the information to my superiors, expecting some sort of recognition. But I was told, keep quiet, this man is useful to us. So Barbie was given a fresh start by the American Secret Service? Yes, Barbie was a beneficiary of the Cold War. Do you think Barbie was an isolated case, an exception? No, no, I've had similar cases. People I've caught in Austria who were free again the next day. Why? Because an American Secret Service agency needed certain individuals as informers. Yes, that was the Cold War. Early 1945, the historic handshake between Americans and Russians at Torgau on the Elbe. But the interests of the Allied forces did not include the complete destruction of fascism. The military and secret services on both sides had begun a race to grab whatever assets were left by the Third Reich. The American Secret Service operated from this former interrogation center of German security near Frankfurt. In Camp King, they held the prominent administrators. The general staff, as well as important figures from industry and research, were brought here. Today, the American 5th Transportation Command occupies the barracks. 
The cells and the rooms where the Nazi elite were interrogated are kept much in their original state. But when we asked to film this historic place, our application was refused. Not for security reasons, but because... Filming in Camp King would not contribute to your story. Moreover, we see no point in associating the US Army of today with a post-World War II period. But what happened in that huge compound that today's US Army does not want to be associated with? Already in the summer of 1945, the American High Command had decided to make use of certain German prisoners who were considered to be exceptionally talented and whose intellectual powers could be exploited. This program was given the code name Overcast, and amongst the exceptionally talented were experts in submarine construction, in military medicine and chemical warfare, as well as rocket research. For many of the German prisoners, their interrogation at Camp King made the difference between a trial at Nuremberg or a new career in the USA. A few weeks previously, American troops had occupied the small town of Nordhausen in the Harz. Plans for the advance were deliberately altered so that the underground factory here could be reached ahead of the Russians, the factory where the V2, Hitler's wonder weapon, was being built right up to the last moment. Pictures of the horrors that were discovered were shown in American cinemas. During the construction of 4,000 rockets in the space of a year and a half, 20,000 prisoners and slave workers had died. But even before the corpses were removed, an American special detachment with secret instructions had transported the remaining rockets and construction plans to the west. There was less interest in the technical equipment than in the masterminds and the organizers of the rocket project. Werner von Braun, Walter Dornberger, Arto Rudolph, and others. When a US Army film crew covered the important moment of their surrender, their SS uniforms were not worn. In the following years, the V-2 became the prototype for civil and military rockets in the United States, leading to Saturn V, which took the first men to the moon, and the intercontinental ballistic missiles with atomic warheads. Today, the V-2 has pride of place in Washington's Space Museum. The first time they attempted to bring von Braun to the United States, a message from U.S. investigators came to Washington that uh, called uh, von Braun an SS officer, which is true, and called him an, quote, ardent Nazi, unquote. And von Braun's first effort to come to the country was blocked in this way. Now, actually, he had, he had already arrived in the country, and they didn't, uh, even though his papers hadn't cleared, and they didn't want to send him back. So uh, what they did is they sent a message back to Germany, say, clear the file, uh, clean up the file. Then they sent a new file over to Washington, and it was at that point that von Braun's uh, papers were finally cleared. Was that unusual, or was it normal to do such things? Yes, it was a regular campaign. It was called Project Paperclip to enlist German scientists after the war. Von Braun certainly was not the only one, he, although he was the most prominent, perhaps. The Americans were also interested in the research carried out by German military doctors who had taken advantage of the opportunity to use concentration camp inmates for their experiments on live human beings. This group of German doctors, led by the military doctor Strukhold, was recruited by the Americans immediately after the war to set up research into the medical aspects of space travel. However, just before the group could be taken to the United States, the trials of high-ranking Nazi doctors began at Nuremberg. Three of the Strugold team had to go into the dock, but were acquitted through lack of evidence and followed their colleagues to America. Siegfried Ruck. Hans Wolfgang Rubber. Victor Ruck. 
prosecution was led by the American chief prosecutor, Telford Taylor. To kill, to maim, and to torture is criminal under all modern systems of law. These defendants did not kill in hot blood, nor for personal enrichment. Some of them may be sadists who killed and tortured for sport, but they are not all perverts. They are not ignorant men. Most of them are trained physicians, and some of them are distinguished scientists. Did you know that some war criminals and former Nazis were being recruited by the Allies, even as you were taking part in the trial? Uh, not, not during the trial, no. <clears throat> uh, I'm sure there are people in the United States at that time who knew about it, uh, but I knew nothing about it until uh, <clears throat> the trials had finished and I had returned to the United States. Mm -hmm. If I became aware that this was going on in the United States, uh, I would have certainly disapproved of it. Yeah. But I would have had no authority and no position from which I could make any comment about it of an official nature. The National Archive in Washington. Here, there are countless documents which enable us to calculate the amount of cooperation between the Allies and former Nazis. As a result of the Freedom of Information Act, most of this evidence became available to historians and journalists after 30 years. Christopher Simpson, a young American author is investigating this dark side of American post-war history. Most of the information about the political rat lines set up by the Secret Service or the military has come into public domain. But in the case of one man, Simpson kept drawing a blank. In the United States and Germany, his records were either suppressed or still marked strictly secret. He was on the general staff of the German army, responsible for all the reconnaissance, that is, espionage, against the Soviet Union. He was therefore a key figure in one of the most murderous campaigns of the war. His name, Reinhard Galen, the prototype of the desktop murderer, as he was described by the renowned Soviet specialist in the American State Department, the one-time CIA agent, Arthur Macy Cox. Galen had tremendous impact uh, on the war. He was one of the major planners of Operation Barbarossa, which was the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union. Uh, he was Hitler's uh, chief of intelligence for the Eastern Front. And uh, so he was a man of incredible influence in the war and in the deaths of millions of uh, Soviet citizens. He was, he was a man who had a, he did not become uh, part of the Nuremberg trials, which was remarkable in my opinion. Uh, I don't know exactly where Galen was then. I know that after that he became an official of the, of the Bonn government. Uh, but uh, where he was uh, when we started the trial, I don't know. Galen was here at Camp King and worked for the Americans in setting up an anti-Soviet secret service. Before the end of the war, he had the foresight to copy his records onto microfilm and bury them. This material formed the basis of military intelligence for the CIA. Later, the Galen organization, the old gang from Nazi days, moved over to the German news services. How could a man who until 1949 was still on the Allies list of war criminals become such an important figure in post-war history? Uh, he has a reputation... Uh, for, With our American uh, colleagues, we visited retired uh, CIA and CIC agents who were contemporaries of Galen. Uh, we're getting close now. The former head of anti-Soviet espionage at the CIA is today a cattle breeder in Virginia. The fact that we would try to get German intelligence, German scientists, German technicians on our side, exactly what the Russians were doing. They were spending an awful lot of time, as you know, getting German rocket scientists and others uh, to the east. So that was, I'd say, 50-50 on either side. Uh, what can you tell us about the Galen organization? Well, the Galen organization was um, uh, very important early on 
uh, because they had um, access to Eastern Bloc agents. Um, they had voluminous files, uh, which uh, many of which had been preserved. He became, because he was, uh, had such assets, uh, he became, for all practical purposes, in the early years after the war, the man who uh, knew the most, uh, was best informed, and best, had the best experience uh, of anybody in the business. Did the Galen organization have a particular ideological bent or uh, prejudice in, in, their, in their reporting? Well, yes. They, um, they were very anti-communist. Uh, so uh, that was both their strength, but it was also their weakness. Um, uh, they tended to be, not to be as objective as, as they could have been. It intensified our distrust of the Soviet Union because all of Galen's people had been devoted to the war against the Soviet Union and their attitudes were such that they could not believe anything good of the Soviet Union and they transferred to us a large part of their uh, information, their understanding of the of what was going on in the Soviet Union, so that we we had uh, we had information in our files which was not accurate, yes. and which was dangerously inaccurate, and intensified the Cold War. And I have had some very interesting discussions with Soviets recently, now that all of this is, they're very open uh, issues and you can talk very frankly about these things. They, very high ranking advisors to Gorbachev, whom I happen to know, have told me that our decision to hire Galen and to put him to work on the most aggressive kind of secret operations was probably the most telling uh, demonstration uh, that the kind of collaboration and trust that uh, uh, we had as allies fighting the Nazis uh, not only had come to an end, but uh, that our that we were uh, very corrupt and uh, all of the uh, allusions that came out of the Nuremberg trials and, and uh, other uh, acts that we took together uh, were blown away. In the Nuremberg trials, 12 of the 20 most serious war criminals were sentenced to death. Later, in the three Western zones, a further 5,000 Nazis were sentenced for war crimes. 600 death sentences were carried out. For the most part, these were members of the German armed forces who were given shorter trials in military courts. All the influential representatives of the Nazi system, the politicians, the military, the lawyers, financiers and industrialists, were walking free by the early 1950s, and most of them back in respectable jobs. The hunt for the war criminals virtually ceased when the Cold War began. I was in Nuremberg in 1948, during the blockade of Berlin. I realized that it was all over. Documents were put away. Trials already planned would not take place. I discussed this with various people. They said, you must live on the moon. Europe is weak. And if Stalin, Uncle Joe, gives the order, we'll be with all the rest in Siberia. The defense of Europe had become the priority. Eventually, in the Cold War, both sides lost. 
Money, people, prestige. The only winners were the war criminals and the Nazis in general. Until the 1950s, the Russians staged big show trials of war criminals. However, very few Nazis in Eastern Europe waited for the arrival of the Red Army. Thousands of collaborators, including entire units of fascist militia and Waffen-SS, left their homelands with the retreating German army of occupation. They mingled with the occupants of the refugee camps in the Allied zones from where they could slip away overseas along the rat lines. We knew these people had committed crimes because survivors had named them in statements. Then we found out from more reports on which ships and on which dates they had got away. We have found such people in Canada, in the USA, even as far as New Zealand. They were Nazi collaborators whose guilt is greater than the Nazis because they were volunteers. And they were destroying their neighbors, as it were. They'd been to school with their victims. They knew them. In the McCarthy era, it was made easier for these fanatical anti-communists to get into the United States than for many survivors of the Holocaust. Forty years later, the then youngest member of the House of Representatives delved into this murky chapter in American history. Liz Holtzman, who became head of the anti-corruption agency in New York City Hall. I had no knowledge that I would find the U.S. government's fingerprints all over this. I didn't realize that it was uh, anything more than just bureaucratic uh, indifference, anti-Semitism. But the more I looked into this matter, the more I saw that you know, there was deliberate government, um, a deliberate government effort to work with, to collaborate with Nazi war criminals. And it's been documented by the General Accounting Office that to bring these Nazi war criminals to this country, US agencies lied to each other. Uh, they may have directly violated uh, presidential policies. Uh, the Justice Department reported that US government officials in the Barbie case violated US laws to protect and employ Klaus Barbie and to conceal um, his presence from the French. So you had a very ugly uh, situation here, and we still don't know the whole story uh, so many years later of, US, of the depths and extent of U.S. government involvement with the Nazi war criminals. Liz Holtzman ensured that Congress passed a constitutional amendment that ordered the compulsory deportation of Nazi war criminals. These are the windows of OSI, the Office of Special Investigations. They have so far brought 80 probable war criminals to trial and imposed a ban on entry to the United States on tens of thousands, including the German financier, Hermann Josef Abs, and the Austrian president, Kurt Waldheim. Hundreds of thousands of people were involved, millions perhaps, in order to uh, implement this systematized uh, reign of terror and brutality. How many of those people escaped, it's hard to say, tens of thousands, clearly. Just as uh, in Germany and Austria today, I have no doubt that there are thousands upon thousands of people uh, with blood on their hands, people who were accomplices, collaborators in crimes, in persecution, who will go to their graves never having been called to account for what they've done. I just... Uh, you know, but they're, they're, certainly in the United States, people with blood on their hands know that our office exists. And uh, they're probably concerned and they, they're always wondering, because they know better than anybody else what they did. They're always wondering whether and how close we are to, to getting to them. And uh, we're gonna try very hard to do that. The first important catch for the OSI was the German diplomat and colleague of Eichmann, Otto von Bolschwing. 
In spite of his participation in a bestial massacre of Jews in Bucharest, he became one of the most senior CIA agents in Europe, having the authority to send spies behind the Iron Curtain. He was allowed illegally into America on CIA papers. Only his death in 1984 prevented him being deported from the United States. Otto Rudolf, an important member of Werner von Braun's rocket team. In 1984, he had to give up his American citizenship. He settled in Hamburg. Boleslav Zmykovskis, a former Latvian police officer, had contacts right to the top of American politics, had to flee the United States and was put on trial in West Germany. Karl Linas, a Ukrainian, a guard at Sobibor concentration camp, deported to Russia where he died in prison. John Demyanyuk, identified by some former prisoners at Treblinka as Ivan the Terrible, deported to Israel, sentenced to death, then acquitted. Liz Holtzman feels very strongly about bringing these old men to justice, some of whom were exploited by the American military, secret service and politicians for many years. I wouldn't begin to compare mm -hmm. the guilt of Germany mm -hmm. and whatever blame the United States has to bear. Yes, we didn't bring these people to justice, mm -hmm. but they were operating under the orders of the Third Reich when they committed the crimes of murder. And the German government at that time was responsible for what happened. Mm -hmm. And the German people today have a responsibility to see that justice is done. The German embassy in Tel Aviv, April 1990. Today, the Simon Wiesenthal Institute is handing over to the diplomatic missions of five countries the names of hundreds of probable Nazi war criminals whose escape routes can be traced through newly discovered documents. We wanted to film the list being handed over in the German embassy. To our surprise, our request was turned down. There was, we were told, no public interest in the matter. Uh, German television, we would like just to take a picture of the uh, embassy, um, the Britain, you know, the, the name of the embassy. On that same day, the whole of Israel observed two minutes' silence. Each year, on the festival of Yom HaShoah, the Jews remember the victims of the Holocaust. Nearly half a century has passed since the victors of World War II made this solemn promise. Those who have been responsible for, or who have taken a consenting part in atrocities, massacres and executions, the three allied powers will pursue them to the uttermost ends of the earth and will deliver them to their accusers. Next week on ABC, the untold story of more than 74,000 Jews interned by the French authorities during World War II and sent to a camp outside Paris, Drancy, a concentration camp, next Wednesday night at 9.30. Coming up, ABC News and Late Line. What the critics are saying about Janus. Don't miss a moment of it. It is exceptional television drama. You won't see anything better than this on television this year. This is great stuff. All those for an election, all those who won Mr. Whitlam to get the hell out of Canberra. Yeah. which you have just heard read by the Governor-General's official secretary was countersigned Malcolm Fraser. Uh, I think when I went into politics, my parents both believed, you know, really, should he be doing this? Would he make an ass of himself? He's very young and all the rest. The Prime Minister of Australia, the Right Honourable Malcolm Fraser. Maybe I originally became a politician in a certain degree of ignorance. 
And I think we should all wish them a long and happy life in which that uh, tourism life wasn't meant to be easy does not apply to them. Well, I was born in Melbourne in a private house in, I think, Grange Road. I'm not sure. And where did you spend your early years? I spent most of it in, uh, in the Riverina, on a property about 50 miles north of um, Deniliquin, on the Edward River. We had 5,000 acres of um, forest country, flooded country, and occasionally station hands would get lost in that country because they had no sense of direction. And I can remember riding out the one uh, day with my father, and he said, you'd um, never, never come out through this country alone, would you? And uh, I'd already been riding alone through it for a couple of years without getting lost. Growing up there, alone, as it were, with your parents and, and, the, and the property, were you particularly close to your mother? Um, well, I think I was close to both my parents. I don't think I was closer to one than the other. What kind of values do you think your parents were most concerned about communicating to you at that time? Honesty and telling the truth and, I suppose, working hard or whatever. Um, Hard work was valued? Oh, yes, work was valued. But work was essential. It was the 1930s. So where did you go to school? I went um, to a preparatory school in Glamorgan for a while. This was in the latter part of the 1930s. Then I went to, um, and this almost started uh, the start of the war, to a boarding school for four years at Moss Vale. Then I went to Melbourne Grammar. Uh, M M Melbourne Grammar is um, a strange school, and I think there are traditions in Melbourne Grammar which are not particularly good for a lot of kids. You know, if you're good academically, that's fine, they do everything for you. If you can play sport reasonably well, that's fine, they'll do everything for you. If you're one of the duller variety, um, I, I think they used to just, in many ways, wash their hands of you. You had, you know, everyone was divided into houses, and. Schoolwork just went on, and sport went on, and you had to go to the cadets and cadet camps. And Do you think that there was anything out of this early time at Melbourne Grammar that shaped you for your later life? I doubt if Melbourne Grammar influenced me at all. I'd hate to say that. Really? Mm. I'd hate to hear me say it. They would. They felt that they shaped people. Yeah, well, I don't think they did. Now, you left Melbourne Grammar having done quite well academically and went immediately off to Oxford. Were you active in the political life of the...? Not at all. Why was that? I didn't want to be. Why? I was probably terrified of making a speech, or having to make a speech. When did you get over that? Oh, 20 years later. Were you intellectually excited? by the ideas you're encountering? Well, some of them. Do you remember, was there any particular tutor or any particular line of argument that for you was a bit of a revelation? Well, you know, one of the things we studied very briefly because there wasn't all that much to it was Machiavelli. Now, the conventional wisdom of Machiavelli is that he was a terrible person um, advocating terrible things. But the truth of it is that he never advocated anything. Now, there's no reason why you couldn't translate Machiavelli into a democratic state and say what you needed to do to stay in power and democracy. You did uh, PPE, philosophy, politics yeah. and economics. Mm. W what do you think, uh, why did you choose that instead of law? Your father had done law, hadn't he? He'd done law, and so the choice was between the two. Um, you know, I would have enjoyed practicing law. But lawyers always regard themselves as superior beings. They are a most arrogant race, they really are, or breed. So you think if you'd done a law degree, you might have learned how to be arrogant? Um, I never particularly regarded that as a sin in politics. At what point did you decide that you wanted to go into politics? Well, that was all an accident. Um, I'd come back from Oxford. The Labour Party held this seat. Um, one or two of them didn't like an ex... That's a seat of one. one and... 
ex-president of the Liberal Party, Magnus Cormack, who was going to stand. And they were saying, well, you know, you won't get pre-selection, but why don't you throw your hat into the ring and it'll at least make it the more interesting pre-selection. And uh, that sort of conversation went on for a little while with a few people. This, was, I suppose, was in late in 1953 or 1954. And I threw my hat into the ring, and shortly after I'd done that, I thought, well, to hell with it. I'm no point throwing your hat into the ring and not winning. So I started to work at it and won. I was 25, but suddenly you realise that you're representing 40-odd thousand people. How did you get on with Menzies? I got on with him well. Um, I always regretted that I hadn't been in one of his ministries, uh, but I think it was probably Harold Holt, who in the end made me a minister, who had argued, oh, young Malcolm's not ready yet. And Harold, I, I mean, I, I'd been, uh, contrary to the views I now hold, I'd argued against the size of the immigration program at one point during the 1950s. I happen to think that I was wrong. Uh, at the time, um, certainly from this perspective. But that was arguing against something that was dear and close to uh, Harold Holt's heart. Yeah, but still, I, I felt it at the time, so I argued it. And anyway, uh, Holt suffered a great deal because he was Prime Minister when Australian servicemen were being sent to Vietnam and conscripts were sent to Vietnam. You know, it would have been sending people into conflict. As army minister, you presided over the period when they were in conflict. Mm. Did you have that same feeling? Yes, I did, but at the same time, I believed that the commitment was right. I still believe it was right. After Harold Holt drowned, there was a change of leader. Mm. Who did you support? I supported John Gorton and shouldn't have. Why did you support him at the time? I thought he could handle Whitlam. He couldn't really, and Haslack might have. But Haslack was a man of intellectual quality. Uh, John Gorton was a Prime Minister who had it all at his feet and kicked it all away. At the beginning, though, from your own personal point of view, it looked as if you'd done the right thing because he promoted you and seemed to respect you. But Haslack would have too. There was nothing in that. So what went wrong between you and Gorton? Well, you've got to understand your attitude to government. I believe that the cabinet procedures were important because uh, certainly in significant issues, you've got to discuss them. You want a variety of minds paying attention to an issue so you know that, uh, what its consequences will be. The more serious the issue, the more important that there be a cabinet discussion. Because, you know, an arbitrary prime minister, not subject to the restraint of those procedures, can be just as damaging to a country as an arbitrary absolutist monarch. There's no difference. So did you become aware of, of, of this style in Gordon that you didn't like from the moment that you were in his cabinet? Well, I become fearful of it uh, from about day two. So what happened then when you decided that you would resign? Well, I just resigned. And did you discuss this with Gorton? Not before I am, no. Why not? Because you'd have your head chopped off. If I was going to resign, I wasn't going to, I was going to resign, I wasn't going to give him the privilege of sacking me. So who did you give your resignation to? I took the unusual course and took it straight to the Governor-General. Legally quite correct, of course. I'm not sure. It was unconventional, put it. At best, it was unconventional. But you always had a great regard for the office of Governor-General. Well, it's, you know, it is a safeguard. It does not make independent decisions, but it makes sure that procedures are followed. It also meant that Gordon couldn't sack you before he accepted your resignation. Once you had a piece of paper from me, he couldn't sack me. It said that he asked, or he has said that he asked you whether you were going to resign and that you assured him that he could sleep well and not worry about he it. He asked me what I was going to do. Right. 
Look, this is one of those occasions. Can we have your version of it? Well, no, he asked me what I was going to do, and I said, you, you can sleep. Look, there had been a quite outrageous television program the night before, which I watched and he watched. Um, but if you've made a decision that you're going to resign, you can't give a warning. It's one of the tough things in politics. I mean, John Gordon had been a close friend of mine. And here I was, going to resign from his government in a way that would probably end his prime ministership. And then you made probably one of the most scathing speeches that anyone has ever made about any leader, let alone his own leader. It wasn't leader. scathing. It was <laughs> in my view, it was objective and balanced and moderate. So I suppose that shows how I was feeling at the time. It took Mr McMahon 63 years to do it. After possibly the most sensational and dramatic week in Australian politics, Billy McMahon was Prime Minister. McMahon got there because of this man, Malcolm Fraser, Defence Minister in Gordon's Cabinet. He dropped the bucket on his leader, charging disloyalty over a series of incidents involving journalists. How did you then stand in relation to your now new leader? I'd never been very close to McMahon. When we got into opposition, there was a conscious effort to try and say some things about what the Liberal Party stood for and to, you know, write some, um, and to make, uh, write some articles about that. And I'd done, um, I, I, it's hard to remember the dates exactly. I, I made one speech to the Alfred Deacon Lecture Thrust and Menzies came out of retirement to chair the meeting for me and that sort of thing. It was the first speech since Menzies that articulated a philosophic view for the Liberal Party. Was that a conscious act? Did yes. you think oh, yes, definitely. this is missing, mm. no one else is doing it? It's missing now, too. Do you think you might do something about it now? Well, I'm too old to do anything about it now. I could write the speech, um, but I'm not sure who I'd want to give it to to deliver it. What did you think of Bill Sneddon? as a leader? If Bill had been content to be it, he'd be a good deputy. It, it is not kind to make somebody leader who hasn't got the qualities to be leader. And what qualities did he lack? I suppose at the end of the day, judgment, resolution. What brought you to be leader of the party? I guess they thought I might be able to win an election. All those for an election, all those who won Mr Whitlam to get the hell out of Canberra! On October 15, 1975, Liberal and Country Party senators voted to defer money supply bills in the Upper House. The pressure began to build in a battle of nerves. stage did you discuss with Sir John Kerr the tactics that would have to be used to deal with this extraordinary situation that, in your view, had happened in the country? Never. Well, there was a point where you did discuss it. Tactics? Just the way in which the whole thing would be handled on the day, as it were. No, uh, tactics were never discussed. Um, going back uh, a while, quite late, I, I knew Sir John fairly well, something Whitlam had forgotten, because I had chosen him to, as my last active Minister for Defence, but I put it into force uh, about four hours before I resigned as Defence Minister to do a study of armed services pay and conditions. And I, John Kerr spoke to me, even though I was just a backbencher quite often, because I knew the problems that he was, had been asked to overcome. And so I got to know him reasonably well. I knew he wouldn't act till the last minute. 
The last minute was when you could act and still have an election and get it all cleaned up before Christmas. And uh, about a week before that, I'd said to Sir John, um, Your Excellency, you know that if there is not election at the end of the day, I'm going to have to say something about what that means. And I regret it, but it will mean obviously saying something about this office. Because I believe that your duty requires you to provide an election or to make sure that there is an election. I think that's very clear from the Constitution and from the historic precedence of the office. In other words, you're the last protector of the democratic system in Australia. And, you know, I would have said, I'm sure that you would want to go down in the history as being that protector, which he will. But he would not have wanted to be condemned for failing the office, for failing that democratic responsibility. What did you feel was the most important thing that you had to do as Prime Minister? Oh, re-establish a sense of stability to the government in Australia, re-establish um, uh, financial stability and, and uh, the circumstances in which investment would start moving forward again, um, explain to countries overseas that um, the Whitlam government had been nothing more than an aberration. We were the first government to preach financial restraint in the middle 1970s. We modified taxation for mining, we introduced some new measures for farming, uh, and we did get our economy into order. Um, but then um, our social policies, family allowances, uh, was a, a dramatic advance and change in terms of the um, the way in which Australia dealt with its less well-off people and uh, families who are in greater financial hardship. Um, the changes to Aboriginal policy and the changes in the multicultural area, multicultural area in particular, were world firsts. Very many people in this world seek power, the power to control, the power to make decisions. Well, the whole purpose of a democratic society, of course, and of democratic government, is to make sure that whoever's president or prime minister, that he doesn't have too much power. And there are two, I think there are two different kinds of politicians. There are those who want power because they have a particular purpose. They want to achieve something, or they want to improve society, or contribute to Australia. But we can't also deny the fact that there are some people who want power just because they like to exercise power. What kind do you think our present Prime Minister, Mr Keating, is? Oh, I think he's got some things that he wants to do. Much more so than Mr Hawke. Shortly after midnight, Mr Hawke entered the tally room to declare a Labour victory. And for several minutes there was pandemonium. I want to make it quite plain that I take total responsibility for the timing of the federal election. I take total responsibility for the conduct of that election. I therefore take total responsibility for the defeat of the government. And I would like to thank all my colleagues and the Liberal Party right around the country for the support they've given, not just over recent weeks, but over the last seven years. What did it feel like to lose that election? Uh, nobody likes being beaten in an election, even if you've won three before. Um, but um, there was uh, obviously a greater freedom and all the rest. But also a great loss of opportunity. Oh, a loss of opportunity. Uh, what I, I should have done is to take a year sabbatical and decide what I was going to do after that instead of um, resigning from the parliament about the same time. Why did you resign? Well, I, I thought that neither Peacock nor Howard would have a real chance if I was there. People would have, um, if things started to go wrong, they'd, you know, wonder when I was going to make a move and all the rest. And I thought I owed it to my successors to give them a clear run. Well, in the event, they mucked it up for themselves anyway, and so far as the 
parties concerned, if I'd been there, the, um, the history of the last 10 years might have been quite different. And the experience that you'd had and the qualities that you'd brought to the leadership could have been used again. Yeah. So you feel you did make a mistake in leaving it? I've already said that. How did you meet your wife, Tammy? Oh, somewhere in Victoria. What contribution did she make to your political life? Well, the most important part of it would, would have been encouragement, help to me, and especially when things were difficult. Um, when you made your speech condemning Gorton, you know, you just really wonder what you're doing and where it's all going, or what the future holds. Um, Tammy played a, a tremendous part and was always enormous encouragement and support and um, always there when needed. And uh, I, I suppose, uh, you know, in many ways, it um, uh, was politically very helpful because with her personality, you know, people would say, well, you know, if Tammy can put up with him, he can't be all bad. Malcolm Fraser has condemned the South African government in an extraordinary Johannesburg news conference. He's predicted violent change and says black South Africans have no other choice. People who are not free, you have no political rights, if they have no capacity, no legal means of arguing for their freedom and achieving it, ultimately only have the force and power that they can muster with their arms. Why do you think Bob Hawke chose you or recommended you to be part of the eminent persons group to go to South Africa? Well, I, I would have carried a credibility in that area that um, a lot of other people would not. I suppose being a conservative politician and also having a credibility in issues of race um, was a help and it was useful. We found that the ANC was certainly ready and willing to negotiate. Um, and the government was also, but at the time the government was only prepared to negotiate on its own terms. We set out in um, our negotiating concept the steps that the ANC would have to take before the government could realistically be expected to sit down with them, and also the steps that the government would have to take. It's interesting that um, in the time that passed after that Commonwealth report in 1986 to the time when negotiations first began between uh, Mandela and, uh, and de Klerk, both the government and the ANC had implemented our negotiating concept to the full. In other words, we described accurately in 1986 what each would have to do as a precondition for sensible and, uh, and worthwhile negotiations. So in that sense, I think we made a very real contribution. We exposed the issues and uh, the analysis that we set down at that time uh, remained valid uh, right through. Would you describe yourself as an optimist? Well, I think probably I am, because I, I, if you weren't an optimist, I think you'd be very stupid being a politician, and probably stupid being involved with a major aid organisation. You've been critical of some of your colleagues on the grounds that they were emotional. That's been a theme in, in well, some of your criticisms. Well, Would you be able to respect yourself? Would you be able to respect a leader who showed emotion publicly? Showing emotion isn't necessarily something that destroys respect. Um, but you really want to make sure, or you want to believe, or I would anyway, that um, a person is in control of himself. Did you feel disappointed with yourself that you showed some emotion on the night that you, that you uh, lost the election in 83? Not very much, but just a little bit showed some, through. Probably. You would have preferred not to show anything? Yes. And yet some people say that it's because you're so in control of yourself that others have sometimes found it hard to see you as a sympathetic human being. Well, maybe. I don't know. What would you like your epitaph to be? I haven't even thought of it. I don't know. 
how would you like people to think of you? Well, maybe they could use that um, quotation from um, the old man. Life wasn't meant to be easy. But take care of child. It can be delightful. an SBS program you consider essential viewing can be very frustrating. If you didn't see the last episode of The Civil War, the SBS special on The Republic, or last week's match of the day, or if you want an informative insight to this month's SBS program lineup, Aerial Magazine is your complete guide. For $42, subscribe for a full year. Aerial, the SBS television and radio companion. Phone 0055 14610 and subscribe now. And so there seems to be no end to this brutal and tragic war. This is Damien Day for Globelink News. All right, Jerry, that'll do. There you go, mate. Yeah, fancy a pint. Oh, by the way, what are you doing next Tuesday? I need a dead Peruvian. Hey, look, cut, Jerry. Drop the dead donkey. Returns Saturday at 8.30 on SPS. Weekend is celebrating its 10th anniversary with a review of the decade. The good times. The bad times. The money made. The money lost. The people you love. And the people you don't. One decade in one sensational good weekend. Don't miss this 170-page 10th anniversary collector's edition in Saturday's Sydney Morning Herald and The Age.
Good evening, welcome to News Extra. I'm Helen Vatsikopoulos. Tonight's headlines. 48 members of a religious cult die in mysterious circumstances in Switzerland. Haiti's military leaders make a surprise public appearance as their power base diminishes. The civil war in Afghanistan intensifies despite a United Nations call for peace. And back home, a green jobs boom. But first, police in Switzerland hope a cassette recording found in a deliberately burnt out building will shed light on an apparent mass suicide. They're still unable to explain the deaths of at least 50 members of a doomsday cult. The sect, called the Order of the Solar Temple, was led by a Canadian homeopath whose whereabouts are still unknown. David Fole compiled this report. In a country where even one violent death is relatively uncommon, 48 bodies have so far been recovered in what appears to have been a mass murder-suicide. In the basement under the charred ruins of a farmhouse near the village of Cherry, police found 22 bodies. Swiss, French and Canadian citizens aged from 18 to 72, but including a 10-year-old boy. They lay in a circle in a red carpeted chapel, clad in red or white robes or golden gowns. One man, apparently a chief priest, was wearing a black robe and had a sword nearby. Half had plastic bags over their heads tied with string. 20 had bullet wounds to the head. While unable to explain the bullet wounds or the fact that some were tied up, the local examining magistrate believes the people chose to die this way. The bodies were not burned. They were, uh, uh, they were more, more or less clear. Uh, everything was <coughs> peaceful. The body of a 73-year-old Geneva man who'd rented the properties four years ago was found in a nearby building. He'd been shot and had a plastic bag over his head. 160 kilometres to the south, near another quiet alpine village, a similar scene was being enacted. 25 bodies, some badly burned, were taken from two of three smoking chalets. Sect leader Luc Jure owned two of the buildings. The cause of the deaths in this case was not clear, although none of the bodies had been tied up. Police said they appeared to have died in their sleep. The deaths in Switzerland have been linked to two others in Canada on Tuesday, and again fire was a factor. The bodies of a man and a woman were found in the burnt-out ruins of a house 80 kilometres north of Montreal. Luc Jure owned the house next door. The two victims were wearing medallions with the initials TS for Tom Soler. Just like the fires in Switzerland, this one involved sophisticated starter devices using tanks of petrol and gas linked by wires to telephones. Luc Jure left Canada for Switzerland last year after pleading guilty to firearms charges. He believes the world will end in a fiery apocalypse. He's the latest in a line of cult figures who've led their followers to a violent death. But while comparisons are being made with the deaths last year of 80 members of the Branch Davidian sect in Waco, Texas, and more than 900 followers of Jim Jones in Guyana in 1978, suicide is yet to be proven in this latest case. United States officials in Haiti are turning up the pressure on the remaining military rulers to quit the country. Port-au-Prince's hated police chief, Joseph Francois, has already fled to the Dominican Republic. In a rare public appearance, the two other military leaders attended a funeral not far from their headquarters. Linda Patillo reports. The Haitian Army's high command today buried the 10 Haitian soldiers killed in a firefight with U.S. Marines last month. For General Raul Cedres and his Chief of Staff, General Philippe Biambi, it was the first public appearance since U.S. troops occupied their country more than two weeks ago. Many wondered whether it would also be their last. The 7,000-man army they command is demoralized and in disarray, and the deadline for the two generals to resign is only 10 days away. General Cedres, will you step down before October 15th? There was no answer today from General Cedres, but U.S. officials here are clearly trying to help him make up his mind. Two months ago, General Cedres moved around the country protected by a force of armed men known as the Ninjas. 
Now these guards have all been arrested by U.S. troops. The sooner the generals leave, the better, said these Haitians standing on the corner next to military headquarters today. Cedrus and Biambi are responsible for all the people who have died in this country, said this man. They killed their fellow Haitians just to stay in power, one woman interjected. Only now, she added, do we finally have the right to say all this. And they are saying it every day. Today, they said it across from military headquarters, the clearest symbol yet that the generals have truly lost their hold on the country. Aid workers have just returned to a Rwandan refugee camp in Zaire after 90 of them fled last Friday in fear of their lives. They had pulled out of the Katali camp, 60 kilometres north of Goma, after Hutus killed a local worker and intimidated others. <laughs> United Nations and Zaire are putting pressure on the refugees to return to Rwanda. Just under a million refugees, mainly Hutus, are living in camps in Zaire, Tanzania and Burundi. But the camps are looking more and more like a government in exile. The refugees are placed according to their home prefectures, the former officials are still their leaders here, and the ubiquitous militia are harassing refugees, profiteering from food distribution and even killing those who try to return home. The ousted government says it's now ready to negotiate power sharing with the new government in Kigali. But Kigali wants those responsible for the genocide to be tried first. A UN commission has announced that the tribunal investigating war crimes in the former Yugoslavia will also deal with Rwanda. Cole Carling is the Director of Emergency Operations for Care Australia, which usually has a staff of 22 in the Katali camp. He's just returned from Zaire. I spoke to him earlier this evening. Mr Carling, you will be going back to the camps. Do you feel any safer this time? Yes, we've never really felt unsafe in the, in the camps themselves, Helen. It's just the tension in the air which... Uh, uh, exacerbates the already difficult task that NGOs have in delivering aid into any refugee situation, but particularly the one up there with so many uh, dependent refugees on the ground. Are you faced with some sort of a moral dilemma in that you have to feed the refugees, but you're also feeding the militia there, and while you're feeding them, they will stay there, they've got somewhere to stay? It is a moral issue, but uh, we look at it on the basis that we are feeding 90% of the refugees who are totally innocent and are totally dependent on our aid and the others are really a matter for the UN to control but from our point of view as an NGO we can only, only deliver aid on the ground to all those hungry people who need it. But their presence impacts on how you do your job because not only do you have to feed them you have to try and talk the refugees into going back home and as long as you do that you will be threatened. Yes well it's not a role for the NGOs to uh, indeed encourage or or talk to the NGOs about going home, that's one entirely for the UN, and it's for the UN to create that safe environment for the refugees to feel secure to return to their homeland. Well then how has law and order broken down in these camps? It's something that uh, often happens in camps of this nature at about this stage. We've gotten over the hump of the initial phase of, of uh, cholera, of uh, uh, disease in the camp, of sheer exhaustion of the refugees having trekked out of Rwanda, we're past that stage now into the maintenance phase in the camp and it's often at this stage that the unlawful elements uh, arise out of the out of the large group and I'm talking about the uh, the gangsters, the extortionists, the black marketeers who come out to uh, to rob their own people of uh, what is duly theirs, that is the international aid food that's to be delivered. Well what can you do about those gangsters? How do you shift the power structure away from them well, again, it's a matter for the UN, in this case, who control the camp, to set up a camp structure calling on the Rwandan, in this case the Rwandan hierarchy in the camp, to take their rightful role of playing a, uh, a senior uh, role in, with their people in encouraging uh, orderly behaviour and indeed identifying those elements that are causing concern and uh, assisting with their control or their removal. Just finally, how will the refugees get home? How will you help get them home? Well, firstly, by creating that safe environment back in Rwanda, and that is one entirely for the UN, and a lot of the work is being put into that right now. 
and secondly the, the actual assistance rather than asking the people to walk back uh, 250 kilometres uh, over a 25-day uh, a uh, march, uh, suffering along the way, there would need to be a, uh, a, an assisted repatriation in the way of transportation and assistance along the way with food, water and medicine. Mr Carling, thank you. Thank you, Helen. In less than an hour, Sarajevo Airport is due to open for the first time in nearly two weeks. Bosnian Serbs had forced its closure following last month's NATO airstrike against one of their tanks. But as Brian Hanrahan reports, food supplies are dwindling fast and its residents are facing a third winter of hardship under siege. The city warehouse is almost empty. By stopping supplies, the Serbs have forced the UN to draw down their stocks just when they should be building up. The last of the UN supplies in Sarajevo are already being handed out. In the winter, if we have uh, several stoppages uh, during a month or two, then it's certainly uh, a few days without the air it would, would mean a very difficult situation. The only route into the city not directly controlled by the Serbs is highly dangerous. A mountain track menaced by Serb anti-aircraft guns it's flanked by burnt-out trucks that fail to beat the blockade. It can't be relied on. Only the airlift can feed the city, and the airport has been closed for 10 days. Like the overland convoys, it can be switched on and off by the Serbs. Despite the improvement this summer, Sarajevo is approaching the winter with no buffer stocks of food. If supplies are disrupted at all, then hunger will be the immediate consequence. So once again, conditions in Sarajevo will become a political bargaining chip this winter as they have for the past two. And the past experience suggests it's a bargaining chip that will be used. For the Cardridge family, with their pie as the only food of the day, it means another miserable winter while political argument is pursued through personal suffering. The Serb grip on the city is as tight as ever. The threat now is famine rather than guns. Factional fighting in Afghanistan has reached a new level of intensity and a United Nations peace mission has called for an end to the hostilities. But the skirmishes around the capital Kabul have drawn in more factional groups. This report compiled by Roland Perotti. The Afghan factions do battle in and around Kabul. It's been like this for two years and is getting worse. Afghanistan is supposed to have presidential elections later this month, but amid scenes such as these, the polls in jeopardy, to say the very least. To complicate matters, the conflict between the forces of President Rabani and those of his former Prime Minister, Gulbuddin Hekmatia, has taken on a new dimension. It's spread to include fighting between two rival Shiite Muslim groups, each of which is now allied with the Rabani and Hekmatia forces, respectively. The two Shiite factions have skirmished before, but until just days ago had avoided open warfare. Amid the destruction and the loss of life, there's the International Red Cross and Red Crescent. To reach hospital, this Red Cross medic has to drive across the line separating the government forces and their enemies. He drives while sounding his vehicle's horn in the hope in deliberately attracting the militia's attention, they won't fire on him. The people of Kabul need all the medical help they can get. Tens of thousands have been wounded in the past two years and about 12,000 killed. Doctors say more than 90% of the wounded are civilians. As the bullets fly outside, the patients are housed as best as the staff can manage. We put the patient in every area that we got in the hospital. We use the mask for the patient. We use the physio room and uh, the other facility in the hospital. The UN has renewed an appeal for an end to hostilities, but all the evidence suggests that's not likely soon. In other world news, South African President Nelson Mandela gains an impressive United States aid package for his country. After two days of talks with US President Bill Clinton, Nelson Mandela came away with an economic aid package for the Southern African region worth 755 million US dollars. You can be certain that the United States will continue to do everything in our power to support the new nation you and your South African people have created and now seek so strongly to build. 
South Africa's transition to democracy has created an historic opportunity for South Africa to play its rightful role for the first time on the world stage. 26 people died and another 27 were critically injured in a fireworks factory explosion in the North Indian state of Uttar Pradesh. Most of the victims were small children busy preparing fireworks for celebrations to mark the Hindu New Year. The cause of the explosion is not known. 5,000 protesters turned out in the streets of Rome to demonstrate against the Italian government's draft budget. Unions are calling for a general strike next week in protest against planned cuts to pensions and health. Several people needed treatment for bruising at Rome's San Giacomo Hospital. National news next, finance, and in our feature tonight, the cost of German reunification. The Berlin Wall came down five years ago, but these days, there's less to celebrate. The cost of reconstructing 40 years of decay in the East is stretching what's left of the carnival sentiment to the limits. Opposition leader Alexander Downer mixed culture and politics today. He released the coalition's priorities for the arts, gazumping the Labour Party, which is launching its long-awaited cultural policy in two weeks' time. The coalition statement is a broad pledge of support for the Australian arts industry, but lacks detail. Marianne Plummer reports. Launching the coalition's art strategy at historic Elizabeth Bay House in Sydney today, Alexander Downer said it will be a feature of his leadership that the arts will be re-elevated to a position of prominence in Conservative Party policy. I am prepared to make, make the concession, but I think in recent years there has been a lack of emphasis on culture and the arts in the coalition. Mr Downer says the so-called cultural frontier document is a broad definition of policy. The details will come later. It supports greater access and participation in the arts, pledges to make the most of new technologies, to market and promote Australian culture overseas, develop stronger arts and business partnerships, recognise the contribution of Indigenous and ethnic communities and increase Australian content in the broadcast media. The timing of the launch, before the government announces its cultural policy, is clearly designed to steal some thunder and support of the arts community from the ALP. It's very important to get away from this notion that somehow the Labor Party has been the party of the arts, because it hasn't been. But Federal Arts Minister Michael Lee denies the opposition has seized any advantage. It's very easy to co come up with uh, grand lines and platitudes. It's very easy for the opposition to uh, read the speeches that the Prime Minister and I have been given, giving for the last six months and pluck out the best ideas. The Immigration Department should make careful checks on Australian men wanting to sponsor Filipinas into this country. That's been the concern at a conference addressing the issue of domestic violence against Filipino women in Australia. A group of Adelaide women who've survived such violence have created a play out of their experiences. Gabby Hills reports. We are not dolls. We are not toys. Even migrants when oppressed, seized, rage, fight. All but one of the women of Book Lodge Kababayong of Adelaide have experienced domestic violence. Filipino women in this country are six times more likely to be killed by their spouse or ex-spouse. Serial sponsorship, where an Australian man may bring in several fiancés over time and be violent towards them all, is one of the major problems. Today's conference heard from the Law Reform Commission that it will recommend the Immigration Department collect and provide information to Filipino women about their future husbands and that if this is done under the Migration Act, it would avoid privacy problems. It's only because of confidentiality, of the protection that the Australian government is giving to this man that we cannot give information out. Booklord Kababayong will tonight present to the conference the complete work, for better or worse, till death us do part. We do have convictions, we do have our rights. In the near future, we will have freedom. And in other national news, Progress has been made in controlling bushfires raging along the eastern seaboard. But firefighters are bracing themselves for an extreme fire danger forecast for tomorrow. 
With such an early start to the bushfire season, New South Wales Premier John Fay went to see how fire services are coping with the latest emergency. Although the January bushfires have meant more money and power for the fire service, it's clear there's little room for complacency. In Queensland, firefighters are battling three new outbreaks around Rockhampton and blazes continue to burn out of control in the Girraween National Park. In response to concern over children being left unattended while parents gamble at the new Melbourne casino, the Victorian government has launched its $4 million strategy for helping compulsive gamblers. Called Break Even, the program includes telephone and personal counselling and will be funded by a levy on poker machines. And after seven years cycling the world, Indonesian Amin Fauzi has arrived in Australia to promote his message of peace and friendship. He'll ride to Darwin via Canberra, Melbourne, Adelaide and Alice Springs. Now finance and the economy and its jobs on the agenda tonight. Joining us now is finance reporter Nigel McCarthy. Nigel, you say we're set for a green jobs boom. What is a green job? Um, a green job, it's a pretty broad category, Helen. We're talking about things like uh, ecotourism, people who work in the whale watch industry, recycling, um, clean production and waste management. So it's, it's fairly big. Uh, Simon Crean, the employment minister, was talking about the topic today and he said that 38% more people are working in this area now than they were five years ago and he estimates that by the year 2000, 700,000 Australians will be working in environment friendly areas. And are jobs the focus in the US as well? Yes they are, there's a, a big uh, report due out tomorrow on the jobs figures. This indicates how the economy is going, it means what will happen to interest rates and interest rates are the biggest game in town at the moment. So it's a big day, let's have a look at some comments. A big day on Friday because the markets are going to be watching very closely the whole report, not just the overall increase in non-farm payrolls, but the unemployment rate. What does the household survey tell us? What do uh, hours work tell us? What does uh, average hourly earnings tell us? And from that big picture, there's going to be an immediate conclusion about whether the Fed's going to tighten again and how soon. And that, for that reason, the market's going to react. The market's already built in some expectation, probably at this point, a better than 50-50 chance that a Fed tightening comes very soon. So this is going to shape that, those odds further. And today's figures. OK, Helen. The all be The 18,000 kilometre trip is expected to take the pair to 17 nations. The route follows the path taken by aviators who rose to an Australian government challenge offering £10,000 sterling to the first team to complete the trip in less than 30 days. The plane is expected to arrive in Australia later this month. Authorities in India are now claiming far fewer cases of the pneumonic plague than first feared. So far, more than 4,000 people have been admitted to hospitals across the country, complaining of plague-like symptoms. But these latest comments have failed to stop other countries taking preventative measures. Even though the plague scare appears to be waning, scores of people are still demanding they be tested. With the outbreak now approaching its third week, doctors claim only one in 20 are testing positive. India's big effort remains convincing foreign countries, from the Persian Gulf to Canada, that all's clear and they should resume their air links with India. So far, 13 nations have severed both air and sea links. Countries like Thailand also keeping its ports clear of the rats thought to carry some strains of the plague. Teams from Thailand's health ministry have caught thousands of rats across the waterfront, testing them for signs of the Indian epidemic. Despite the Indian optimism, Thailand remains cautious. The national airline is to allow passengers to land in New Delhi, but won't allow any new passengers on board. Indonesia says it will not impose a nationwide ban on the activities of the radical Alakar Muslim sect. Indonesia's Attorney General says the Malaysia-based sect does not pose a threat to the national stability of Indonesia. 13 out of Indonesia's 27 provinces have the sect. 
Japan's recession is officially over, but in its wake is a workforce changed forever. The notion of lifetime employment, a pillar of the Japanese system of corporate loyalty, has been shattered. They trip to the office faithfully each morning, but increasing numbers of Japanese salary workers have no real job to go to. Like Hiroshi Sato, who arrives at this printing company only to punch his time card and immediately leave. I just check for any messages on my desk, says Sato-san. These days it takes me only a minute. The rest of the day he spends in a coffee shop or at the library. Japanese call them the window-hugging tribe. Employees still paid on sufferance, but discarded from active duty. While some firms will do everything but sack their employees, fearing a collapse of the corporate loyalty on which this economy is based, other companies are far less delicate. Yutaka Kasahara was a middle manager with a chemical company in Tokyo until last week. Sacked after 24 years' service, he got no redundancy payment. Tetsufumi Fujita, a section chief with a computer firm, was forced to take early retirement at 47. Because it's almost impossible for Japanese executives of his age to switch companies, Fujita-san has had to start again from scratch. But his squid restaurant is not doing well, and now the family home is being sacrificed. As the high cost of doing business in Japan causes more companies to invest overseas, the job losses will accelerate. By one estimate, pushing Japanese unemployment close to 10 million by the turn of the century. A key military leader has fled Haiti as exiled President Jean-Bertrand Aristide prepares to return home. The president has told the UN General Assembly he'll be back in Haiti within 10 days. The man who's said to have masterminded the coup fled Haiti in the early morning for the neighbouring Dominican Republic. Michel Francois was in charge of the Haitian police and used them in conjunction with the army to stay in power. The paramilitary system in Haiti is unravelling. The attaches, the ninjas and frap, for so long the architects of oppression, are being neutralised. The police, who only two weeks ago were beating civilians, are now to be watched over by international police led by this man, former New York Police Commissioner Raymond Kelly. We're going to be involved in, you might say, on-the-job training, on-the-street training. His headquarters now wrecked, his organisation in tatters, frap paramilitary leader Emmanuel Toto Constant has suddenly become a Democrat. I pledge to work as a member of a loyal opposition within the framework of a democratic process. Still, there have been no US fatalities. The Americans are clearly in control and the timetable for Jean-Bertrand Aristide's return is on track. Today, he told the UN he would return to Haiti in 11 days. It would be, he said, his rendezvous with reconciliation. Yes to reconciliation, no to violence, no to vengeance, no to impunity, yes to justice. And symbolically, Haiti will tomorrow be linked once again to the outside world, with the re-establishment of commercial airline flights into the capital. A year after turning tanks on the Russian White House, President Boris Yeltsin says he sees no threat from his political opponents. He's even talking of allowing communists into the government, but his hardline critics aren't impressed. Whatever political intrigues Mr Yeltsin might devise, these people are unlikely ever to support him. A year after tanks opened fire on the White House, a few hundred mainly old communists gathered in the early morning wind and rain to remember those who died. Mr Yeltsin's decision to send in the tanks a year ago was a dramatic way of defeating his political opponents. But in fact, the president's relations with the new parliament are only improved by the fact that it has less power. Mr Yeltsin effectively rules by decree. The president marked the anniversary with a news conference at which he spoke of stability and an economy on the mend. And he said there was no reason why communists couldn't find a place in his government. If he's serious, it shows that in the year since he ordered the tanks to move in, he too has learnt something about compromise. The irony of Mr Yeltsin's remarks will certainly be appreciated by his reformist critics. Those who were once his most ardent supporters now say he's given up on economic reform. Nobody has a plan uh, to transform the economy. Nobody pursues any real decisions. We've seen waves, I would call them shock waves, of uh, presidential decrees, but nothing concrete. 
For these people, Mr Yeltsin remains simply the wrecker of the communist system, and even those who once backed him doubt that he's the man to rebuild Russia. Swiss firefighters responding to an emergency call have stumbled onto what may be the scene of a mass suicide. 37 people believed to be sect members have been found dead in two log cabins that had been set ablaze. The death toll could be worse, according to fire officials, who say they are still checking a third cabin. Emergency inspections have been ordered on all Aero Commander aircraft in Australia. The action comes after authorities suspended the search for nine people aboard a plane that disappeared on a flight to Lord Howe Island off Australia's east coast. An Air Force Orion was loaded with sea rescue kits, then scrambled to help cover the 24,000 kilometre search area around where debris was located yesterday. There was some sort of uh, a fire. You, you'd notice that most of them are, are fire damaged and, and certainly smoke damaged. It may well have come apart in the air. More wreckage was recovered, but with little expectation that any of the nine aboard the Aero Commander survived the crash, CAA officials were this afternoon meeting to consider winding up the search. With speculation that the plane may have broken up in flight, there is now growing concern over the 30-year-old Aero Commander model. The ABC has obtained extracts from a United States safety report released last year, prompted by the unexplained crash within 12 months of two Aero Commanders on descent and the near loss of another, the report went on to document nine more accidents involving the plane because of in-flight structural failure. The report recommended that an aviation department directive be issued requiring operators to inspect and check the aileron control system. There have been some uh, cases uh, of possible structural failure overseas uh, and we've certainly been uh, monitoring that. Shortly after that report, an aero commander carrying mail from Canberra plunged into the ocean off Sydney while descending. Late this afternoon, a surprise announcement from the Civil Aviation Authority. All aero commanders in Australia are to be urgently inspected for airworthiness even before the Bureau of Air Safety investigation is finished. We just could not afford to wait uh, for the uh, time that it may take them to produce the report. Fifteen of the planes remain in service in Australia. At the same time, the CAA said there was nothing to indicate Seaview Air had deviated from its safety regulations. Health officials in Queensland are now almost certain that the deaths of horse trainer Vic Rail and 14 horses were linked. They believe it was passed on by close contact with the horses, possibly saliva, perhaps the first known equine virus capable of killing humans. A day after the funeral of Vic Rail, health officials were finally able to shed light on what killed him. They ruled out an earlier finding of Legionnaire's disease and now believe he died of an almost identical illness to that which killed 14 thoroughbreds. From tests so far conducted uh, at the Animal Health Laboratory, there is strong presumptive evidence that the same virus uh, which killed the horses also killed Mr Rail. The virus attacks the lungs and health officials believe it's possible Mr Rail acquired it by hand feeding a sick horse. They now believe they may be dealing with the first known horse virus that is a potential human killer. Two other workers at the rail stables have also shown signs of having had the virus, but are no longer at risk. The equine virus is a previously unknown strain linked to the same viral group which causes measles and distemper. It's still possible it's a mutant virus, but animal health experts are confident they're not dealing with an epidemic does not appear to be one which will easily move from horse to horse. While officials are still puzzled as to how the virus has developed, they don't believe it's moved outside the immediate stable area. With much of the mystery unravelled, officials have lifted the ban on Brisbane racing. But Saturday's Eagle Farm meeting will be limited to horses from stables in the quarantine area. The scare has cost the Queensland racing industry up to $4 million and officials are hoping for a clean bill of health next week. New South Wales is facing another day of extreme fire danger. Conditions in the past 24 hours have partially eased the fire concerns after a desperate overnight struggle when a blaze forced the evacuation of towns near the Hunter Valley. It was a fire along a huge front, flames stretching 15 kilometres across the Hunter Valley. Winds that had gusted at 100 kilometres an hour were beginning to moderate, but for fire crews, the work was just beginning. So while the wind's pretty mild now, now's the time to put the burn in, to try and make the, safe, the area safe. 
After sweeping past the settlement of Ellalong, the blaze was heading east towards more townships. Only a wind change would reduce the danger. 2,200 hectares were swept by fire before relief arrived. No wind change is coming around. West South, surrounded the West South West now. Near Nimbin in far northern New South Wales, volunteer crews continued to battle fire and thick rainforest. There have been several outbreaks in the region over the past five days. Firefighters are concentrating on protecting homes scattered along the ridges. Get back burning our house! Another fire is burning along the border with Queensland in the Girraween National Park. Crews are having trouble getting access to the flames. They say it may take several days to contain. There are still 57 fires throughout New South Wales. A huge blaze continues in the Guy Fawkes National Park near Dorigo and a fresh outbreak this afternoon south of Kempsey. The fire in the Hunter Valley is now under control, but the outlook isn't good. Winds are expected to pick up and turn back to the northwest tomorrow. Emergency officials have declared a day of extreme fire danger. Turning now to Wednesday's finance news. And Tokyo shares rebounded, the Nikkei average up nearly 1%. Hong Kong stocks dived 2% in strong selling by overseas buyers. In Singapore, shares closed firmer for the third consecutive trading day. Investors worried about a possible local interest rate hike stripped the Australian market of 1% of its value. The country's dollar crept up towards the 74 US cent mark, while Hong Kong gold and Australian bullion slipped in value. Australia is off to a good start in the second test against Pakistan, with Captain Mark Taylor breaking his run of ducks. Craig McDermott replaces injured Glenn McGrath in the Australian test side, with Tim May dropped for seam bowler Damien Fleming on a green top wicket. Pakistan won the toss and put Australia into bat. Despite the green wicket, Mark Taylor hoping it was a good sign of a change in fortunes after the first test loss. Well, won the toss last game and lost the game, so hopefully we can turn that around. He was undoubtedly also hoping to turn around his own performance, the disappointing pair in Karachi affecting his confidence. His tentative approach seized on by the Pakistani paceman. <laughs> Taylor then had his own slice of luck. But once off the mark, he began to settle in. The other opener, Michael Slater, was also off to a shaky start, dropped when only on two. Runs were hard to come by as the two batsmen tested the field. At one stage, Taylor only managed 18 or 54 balls, Slater 10 off 31. Australians will have to win here to have any hope of taking the series. And a short time ago, Australia was 3 for 208. Athletes are gathering in Japan's industrial city of Hiroshima for the start of the Asian Games. Among the more controversial participants, China's flamboyant running coach Ma Junren with his army of athletes. Ma is the man behind world record performances by China's women middle distance runners. In 1993, two of his top athletes broke three world records at their national championships. Ma received a battering from some Western journalists over accusations that drugs were behind his runners' record efforts. Instead, he claimed mystery ingredients were the cause. But Ma cautioned journalists not to expect too much from his squad when they run next week in the Games. He said they were in their rebuilding stage and were training to peak for the 1996 Olympics. But he still expected four to five gold medals. Time now for a look at Thursday's weather forecast. And Kuala Lumpur and Singapore can expect storms and 32 degrees. Also storms for Manila and Bangkok, 31. Fine and 26 in Jakarta, showers and 29 for Ho Chi Minh City, cloudy and 28 in Hong Kong. In Australia, showers expected for the Cocos and Christmas Islands. Late rain heading for Melbourne and Hobart, a cold change and showers in Adelaide, but fine for the remaining capitals. Now let's look again at the main stories in this bulletin. The United States to lift trade sanctions against China after the signing of a nuclear weapons agreement. Hong Kong Governor Chris Patton fails to improve Sino-British relations over Hong Kong following his annual speech at the Legislative Council. And cleanup work continues on the northern Japanese island of Hokkaido after a second powerful earthquake in less than 24 hours rocked the island. And that's the news from Australia Television for the moment. I'm Rosemary Church. Bye for now.
obviously didn't want to be sacked before I resigned. I find that uh, almost offensive. Absolute and utter bullshit. Generation has taken over. John Houston has lost. The situation was becoming intolerable. Politically, I disliked him and distrusted him. The Menzies Era on the Liberals commences 8.30 next Wednesday. It was during her childhood... He followed me in there. ...that the offence took place. I took off my dress because I was scared. But she can still remember. I was crying. And she wants to see justice done. I think you ought to think about this very carefully. I want him to know what it's like to feel dirty and ashamed. A powerful story about sexual abuse. He did those things to me. Janus, 8.30 Thursday, ABC. Our species has the heaviest parental burden of any animal on Earth. Why do parents lavish so much love and attention on raising their young? It's the arrival of the firstborn that marks the moment when they begin to question the human life cycle. Society's moulding of our children can be constructively inventive or potentially violent. These particular children have been trained as expert killers. There's a vacant blankness on their faces. The Human Animal, 9.30 Thursday, ABC. John Lennon, you have the English eccentric and you have the, the you know, American 1950s rock and roller. You see Elvis in him, you see Little Richard in him, you see Chuck Berry in him. I mean, he was into the whole sort of, you know, backstreet raucousness of it, really. But he had a bit of a sort of conscience and a bit of a, you know, the soul of a poet and that. John Lennon was the one that really struck me as, as like just being something I'd never witnessed before. I'd never seen anything like that before. He wasn't just a musician. He was, you know, he was a poet. He was a, an artist. He was a great songwriter. He was a great singer. I think he was the real rock and roll person of the Beatles. And he had that sort of edge to his voice that little Richard has. A real hard-edged rock and roll voice. Now, I don't really think there's any person who's a musician today who was not influenced in part by the Beatles and Lennon in particular. I can't imagine a world without John Lennon. Here come on. 